Welcome to the Food Fight podcast from EIT Food, exploring the greatest challenges facing the food system and the innovations and entrepreneurs looking to solve them. I'm Matt Eastland, and we're back for the second instalment of our Good Food for All competition mini-series. This series is exploring the innovations acknowledged for their merits in transforming food systems for a better tomorrow from the recent competition held in conjunction with the UN Food Systems Summit. And once again, I am joined by my very good colleague, Barbaros Korokoglu, who's our Strategic Relations Manager here at EIT Food, to talk about these innovations. Hey, Barbaros, good to have you back on the show. Thanks, Matt. It's amazing to be here and welcome to the show, everyone. Thank you very much, Barbaros. Now, if you are just joining us, I absolutely implore you to listen to part one, where we talked about the competition in detail. But in case anybody needs a refresher, Barbaros, could you please briefly highlight again what the Good Food for All competition was all about? Of course, Matt. This year, the very first ever United Nations Food System Summit took place. And adjacent to that summit, we organized together with the United Nations and stakeholders across the world a competition called Good Food for All. Our objective was to identify the most out-of-the-box, innovative, interesting, change-making SMEs from across the world who really make a difference for the food systems and food systems transformation. So nearly 2,000 applications came in to identify the best SME out there. And as a result, 50 of them have been selected and awarded and recognized by the United Nations. And um, yeah, we'll be hearing shortly about some of them as well. Fantastic. Thanks, Barbaros. Thank you for re-clarifying for everybody once again. During the first episode, we heard from the winners involved in improving farming practices. And in this episode, we're going to look at the SMEs using natural elements to their benefit and particularly solar power. Hi, everyone. My name is Nemeka Ikewono. I'm founder and chief executive officer at Cold Hobbs in Oweri, Imo State, Nigeria. So Cold Hubs is a company that builds and maintains 100% solar-powered walk-in cold rooms in developing countries. And this allows farmers to store food, helping to extend their product shelf life from two days up to 21 days. First, we realized that solar was the way forward for us because we were building out cold rooms in the middle of nowhere, you know, where there was no greed. So we realized from day one that for us to actually power the cold rooms and the cooling units, we needed some form of solar energy. Fortunately, Nigeria, our country, is abundantly blessed with uh, sunlight, approximately more than 250 days of uh, sunlight starting from 7 a.m. and going up till 6 p.m. You know, so we harness that. And the third reason was we wanted to look very green. You know, on my radio shows, I've talked about a lot about green living, and we clearly couldn't be seen running fossil fuels, which we have criticized. So uh, we needed to be appear green to the Nigerian public, which is more or less practicing what you preach. We leverage on that. We also wanted to demonstrate a new green cooling and the model of green cooling that we wanted to demonstrate was to prove that uh, cooling can be done in a way that is sustainable. So that was Nameka talking there and you know I I guess it's one of these things that it just seems so obvious right so the country has so much solar power and it's free it's sustainable and it seems like an obvious solution. And so, Barbara, do you think more companies should be, sorry, excuse the pun, seeing the light in this opportunity? They absolutely should. And I think we already see some good examples from across the world. I mean, I live in Belgium, I'm from Turkey. And here in Belgium, the wholesale markets are now covered with solar panels to provide the green electricity to these uh, wholesale markets. But again, what this SME is doing is quite fascinating. They are harnessing the power of solar energy to power cold cooling rooms, which we know are in quite dire need in these countries. Because we know, for example, in these countries that farmers, largely smallholder farmers, cannot bring their produce to market exactly because there's a lack of cooling units. Mm. There's, a, there's a lack of preservation facilities along the route. So such cooling facilities will definitely help these small farmers, small or large farmers really, to bring their produce to market so that they can earn a living from what they produce from their own land. 
the land that they largely manage themselves. So they're also the stewards of their land. So it's an amazing infrastructure. It provides storage for produce to reach the market, to reach to those in need. It provides an in income for these farmers. Again, talking about food systems, right? It tackles food loss from happening. It prevents food loss. It ensures food security for everyone so that the food can be preserved more. It ensures, above all else, of course, food safety, which is very critical, we know. I mean, mm. foods are quite perishable in heat, especially in countries like Nigeria and elsewhere. So cooling units are extremely important there. And of course, the resilience of the food system. So how, again, with the COVID, we have seen a major shortage of food from across the world. And this kind of infrastructure off the grid, independent from fossil fuel or energy shortages, they really help build the resilience of our food system. Yeah, thanks, Barbara. So I guess one of the things that I take away from this is I genuinely myself had no idea that something so simple as cooling can extend the the sort of the shelf life or the you know preserved foods from two days up to twenty one days. I mean that's that's incredible. You know, it's something which I think we probably take totally for granted. And it's great that um, Nameka and his SME is really looking to solve what is obviously a really big problem for them. And do you think that? An innovation like this it will really transform the supply chain in Nigeria, for example? I think yes, both in Nigeria and elsewhere, right? It is definitely a replicable solution and the one that should be encouraged in all honesty. So how can we reduce our dependence on fossil fuel or, you know, grid electricity, grid energy? Definitely, we should be looking into these kind of solutions. And again, just replicate wherever possible. Solar energy is out there. We just need to harness it harness it for the benefit of greater populations, greater society. Mm. And it's obvious that Nameka has got really big, big plans as well, because when we spoke to him, he highlighted that next two to three years, they plan on building, what, 500 cold hub rooms for farmers, which is, you know, growth-wise, that's pretty astounding. And here is what Nameka said about their technology's current impact. The impact of cold hubs is incredible. In 2020, we were able to save 40,200 tons of food from spoilage. This is typically the food that is thrown away, which is aggregated volume of food stored inside the cold rooms. We were able to increase income for 5,250 users from 60 US dollar every month to 120 US dollar every month at minimum. You know, we've created a total of 54 new jobs for women by hiring and training them to work as our hub operators and market attendants. And the 40,200 tons of food that was saved inside the cold room had no chemical, biological contamination. This became safe, hygienic, nutritious food for public consumption. And by leveraging on the immense potentials of solar energy, we have been able to save more than 1 million kilograms of CO2 by kicking out diesel generators from any of our cold room and relying on renewable energy exclusively. So the impact is multifaceted around reducing food spoilage, increasing income, ensuring gender equality and contributing to a greener world today. Wow. Uh, I mean, I know... <laughs> I know that Barbaros is big into impact on our uh, on our <laughs> side at EIT Food, and that just seems to tick all the boxes, right? He was talking about reducing food loss, reducing the need for chemicals to preserve food, which means the food is healthier, saving what, 1 million tonnes of CO2. There's a social and gender angle here. There's jobs. I mean, phenomenal, right? Absolutely. Co-benefits all the way and changing the food system, right? So... It's fascinating. It's certainly fascinating what they're doing. And especially now, I mean, we heard that they have reduced already 1 million tons of CO2. And as the world, we are looking at these kind of tangible solutions that really do make an impact to really reduce our climate footprint and really stop and reverse climate change. It is massively, massively important. Yeah, big kudos to Nameka and his team. This is um, yeah, amazing what they're doing. And I, I wish them all the best as well in the future in terms of the scaling up. So well done. So now to our next winner, who's also seen the potential in solar energy. Hi, my name is Clementine Chambon and I am the co-founder and CTO of Ordra Development Solutions. 
Uija is a social enterprise. Our mission is to increase the income and livelihoods of smallholder farmers. And what we do is we provide different vertically integrated clean energy services to farmers in northern parts of India. You just heard there from Clementine Jambon from Uja Development Solutions, which, as she explained, is a company that provides installs and maintains solar energy systems for agriculture use. So basically, the problem is that lots of farmers are reliant on diesel to irrigate their crops and for other applications, like for milling what they produce. And it's a problem because it's really expensive and they can't irrigate property, so they have really low agricultural yields. And they're also trapped in poverty as a result. So basically, what we do is... Solar technologies for agriculture can be way cheaper, but the upfront cost and buy one in the first place is really high. So instead of trying to sell a solar pump to a farmer or a solar mill, we provide it as a service. So we provide milling as a service or irrigation as a service where we buy the solar pump and then any farmer can use it and they just pay according to how much they use it. So that's kind of the model. It's like it's an innovative business model to be able to bring needed technologies to smallholder farmers. Oh, how interesting. So from what I take from that is that on the farmers, there's no upfront costs here and it's a pay-as-you-use model. So, Barbos, what are your immediate thoughts about the business model and how useful that will be? I mean, we see this business model applied by various companies across the world. I mean, there is this one automotive company in China who developed a battery as a service model. And indeed, when you buy a car, you actually do not only buy the frame of the car and not the battery. Mm. And the battery is given to you by the company. And then when you want to charge your car, you just go into a fuel station, you charge up your battery, but that's also on membership. So you actually pay a very little fee for getting your vehicle charged and go. We see the same business model here. As you said, Matt, pay as you go, no upfront costs, benefiting everyone. And I suppose what it means as well is that, that this should then allow farmers to have much greater access to this kind of technology as well, right? Because it seems to me that this was obviously a barrier before. Definitely. I think access to energy is always an issue. We know that, for example, diesel prices are quite prohibitive, but they also fluctuate quite a bit. So farmers can never rely or hedge their risks for these price fluctuations. But if they have access indeed to this kind of like clean energy, it is fantastic. Thanks, Barbara Ross. And coming up, you've now got Clementine talking about the future of her company. There's this disconnect between the fact that actually most of the world's farmers have very small pieces of land. So we're talking about one to one and a half acres, and they're really not very profitable. It's difficult to earn a sustainable living out of such a small piece of land. And there's also, you know, disproportionately, even though these farmers grow a huge amount of the world's food, they don't have the same access to services, goods, and information that they need to be able to, you know, grow things more efficiently. Plus they face the already devastating impacts of climate change. So what we want to see happen is that better distribution of these technologies and information that farmers need so that they can plant crops that would be adapted to the local climate stresses, that they will also fetch a higher market price and that they can earn a better income from. Because you have to remember that even if it doesn't represent a huge proportion of a country's economy, agriculture still creates jobs and you know provides income for a huge proportion of the population in the global south basically can play a really catalytic role in pulling people out of poverty. And that also is interlinked with all the different SDGs you can, you know, the UN SDGs, you can interlink them in part to agricultural activities. So yeah, we want to see agriculture being used as a bigger force for pulling people out of poverty while also having an impact on the climate. That's really interesting. And I think this is one of the things maybe we forget sometimes is how important agriculture is in developing countries from an employment and a jobs and um, bringing people out of poverty point of view as well. So it seems to me that what Uja are doing is is really looking to build on you know the existing need and just make things better. Is that something you would agree with, Barbaros? I agree. And also food is a human right, right? So the more we can improve access to food, healthy food, we actually contribute to the development of our civilization as a a whole. And indeed, SDGs have been mentioned, absolutely, this is very, very critical. So what really excites me about this is that Uja have just raised an equity round now, so their focus is very much on growing globally. And we also found out they want to expand and provide even more services to farmers, so looking to diversify. So for example, 
farmers might not have access to quality goods and seeds, so they actually want to start providing solutions so that they can continue to sustainably increase their income. So obviously, Uja have started with one particular product and model, but looking to provide more and more services to make life easier and better for farmers, which is fab. We love that. So moving away from solar power now to a company tapping into the potential of salt water. Hey, it's Ryan Lafers. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Red Sea Farms. So Red Sea Farms are reducing the carbon and water footprint of our food sector by developing and delivering environmentally sustainable salt water based agricultural systems. So Red Sea Farms develops technologies to enable agriculture on marginal lands using resources that haven't traditionally been tapped. So one of our claims to fame is that we use salt water in a lot of our systems. My co-founder, Mark Tester, and I met on the shores of the Red Sea about eight years ago. So that was at a university called Kaust. And what's amazing is that you look to one side and there's all this water and you look to the other side and it's just a complete desert. And you think to yourself, we have so much water and yet we can't grow food with that water because it's too salty. So really, that's the inspiration behind Red Sea Farms is how can we use this significant resource that we have, you know, 97 percent of Earth's water supply is salty. How can we use a significant resource to meet this real need that we have for food and especially for local food security? Yeah, I have to admit, I mean, I'm really with Ryan on this and it's something that that I've often wondered about. In fact, I did my master's in renewable energy. We actually focused on this region. I was always thinking it's so crazy that really, really dry, arid regions where you've got so much sun, for example, yet you've got so little water. And surely there is a really nice way of pulling both these things together. And it seems that this is exactly what Red Sea Farms are, are looking to do. Uh, and Barbaros, you know, what, what kind of impact do you think this technology might have on the region? I think if we, if we look at the latest IPCC report, in the best case scenario, sea level will rise by 35 centimeters across the world, which means that actually we will lose a good uh, amount of our fertile lands into becoming marginal lands or remaining under the water. So that is one point. The second point is we are using a lot of energy actually today to convert seawater into drinkable potable water. And Indeed, this solution sounds like it's actually using salt water mm. to grow agriculture, to, to grow crops. So it is quite promising, I think. I'm curious to hear more about it now. Well, funny you say that. Uh, we spoke to Ryan about the technology they use, and he's going to explain a bit more now. Red Sea Farms has four broad bins of technology. So the first bin is plant science. So there's a lot of work that goes on into breeding and hybridization of plants that are more salt tolerant, that can grow in marginal environments or with salt water. We also have a bin around active cooling. So our active cooling systems use salt water for evaporative cooling. We also have some liquid desiccants that we use for humidity control and also nighttime cooling and chilling, which is really important in tropical and humid regions. And we have an active cooling system that captures and reuses humidity in the cooling process to reduce the total water footprint as well as purify the air. So that's really attractive for industries like indoor livestock, poultry, etc. Then we have a bin around passive cooling. So we have a film that blocks infrared light from entering into the greenhouse. So that prevents heating and reduces the amount of cooling that's required, all while being fully visible in the spectrum that plants need for photosynthesis. In addition to that, we have some solar PV that we use for operating our cooling and our irrigation technologies within the greenhouse. And then the last bin is monitoring and control. So we have our own in-house developed sensors, hardware, as well as software for controlling like the systems that I described, as well as monitoring the performance. So those are the broad four bins, plant science, active cooling, passive cooling, and autonomous control. So that's pretty amazing then. So it sounds to me that what they're doing is they are actually using salt water to directly on plants that are just more resistant or maybe more adaptable to this anyway, which again, why has nobody thought about doing this before? Maybe <laughs> they have. And the other thing, again, we don't think about this because we're, you know, in our regions, we're always like, we need more sun. We need more sun on plants. But actually by blocking the UV rays, 
they're actually reducing the need for cooling, which in the southern regions is going to be a lot more important. So, yeah, fascinating, fascinating things that they're working on. Any thoughts, Barbaros, on this technology? I think what Ryan and the Red Sea Farms have done is, again, what, what the other SMEs did, right? So they looked at the challenge and instead of being discouraged by it, they just like tackled it head on mm. and came up with a brilliant solution from out of it. So indeed, it's super innovative. It's super interesting and very promising for the future. We know that we, we all have to deal with the climate change. We have to adapt to it. We have to mitigate it as much as possible. But climate change is part of our life. So these kind of technologies, these kind of solutions will be needed more and more as we go forward. Yeah, thanks, Barbaros. Yeah, real, a real innovation and you know, tapping into an untapped resource, which is uh, really fantastic. So on to our final guest, who is also focusing on sustainability. Hello, my name is Tali Nehushtan, CEO of InnovoPro. InnovoPro is a food tech company. We were founded in 2015 by Dr. Ashos Shmulovic. We have a proprietary technology for the extraction of 70% chickpea protein and other chickpea derivative. That was Tali Nekastan describing InnovaPro, who are bringing plant-based protein ingredients to the global food market to create nutritious, tasty, safe and sustainable food products. And I'm also really pleased to say that InnovaPro are one of our EIT Food Rising Food Star startups, and we're really championing all of the work they're doing in the plant-based protein market. Chickpea protein is unique because it has a combination of properties that it's hard to find today in other plant-based protein. It has a high concentration of protein, a very nutritious one. It has a very mild taste. It is a very strong emulsifier and a very soluble protein, and it enables the creation of clean label applications. I'm, I love Innova Pro, and mainly because I absolutely love chickpeas and just think everything to do with chickpeas is great. But I think the innovation here, and again, you know, I, I knew that chickpeas were high in protein, but being able to just extract that out as just a pure protein is phenomenal. So some serious potential in chickpeas then, Barbaros. I think there's great potential, as Tally explained, right? I mean, it's, it's easily soluble. It has a good taste. People are quite familiar with the chickpea as a taste, as a texture as well. So absolutely great potential there. And again, chickpeas, we should not only look at the chickpea as a source of protein, but also what does the chickpea plant does, right, for the soils. I mean, it's part of the crops. It's part of those plants that actually fix nitrogen into soil. So absorbs the nitrogen that's in the air, fix it into soil and makes the soil more fertile for mm -hmm. the next harvest. So Massive environmental positive impact. It can be grown in arid conditions. And as far as I know, even the plant itself can afterwards be fed to, to livestock. So us humans consuming the chickpea and then the remaining plant being consumed by livestock so or being mulched into the soil. So amazing, amazing. And again, we are looking here at protein diversification yeah, and reducing our environmental impact in consuming proteins. Yeah, the power of the chickpea. I mean, I have to admit, I never realized all all that you were just saying there about the sort of the chickpea plant as well. So it's this seems like an all round good thing, which is brilliant. And what do you think gave InnovaPro the edge over other plant based solutions in winning this competition? Because you know we know that there are a lot uh, of alternative proteins out there. Yes, I think of course chickpea is available to be grown in many countries. So the solution itself could be scalable. So it's a pulse that can be grown across the world in the most arid conditions. So people can have access to this valuable, precious protein source. And again, at the moment, everyone is in a race to put on the market the next meat alternative, the next protein alternative. So I think an Innova Pro has a very tangible product at hand. So yes, exactly. Why not harness it? Yeah, thanks, Barbara. And I'm sure there is some amazing tech and innovation goes into it. But on the face of it, yeah, like you say, we are taking an existing food stuff here and just extracting some of that goodness which then can be used in other things so like i say there's probably all sorts of tech that i'm not aware of that does that but it sounds nice and simple which i like our process is uh, all based i think about the idea of sustainability we source the chickpeas 
uh, in North America. They grow in large scale in North America, and we process them based on our sustainable technology that uses less water, less energy than other technologies that are common in use today. And we use uh, wet processing for that. At the end, we use all the byproducts. We would like to uh, basically have a zero waste process in the end. A sustainable technology which also uses all of the byproducts so that you actually get zero waste. That's pretty incredible. So, Barbaros, you know, what impact do you think making changes like this are going to have on the food system? Again, here we are looking at co-benefits, right, Matt? So chickpea protein, protein diversification, positive benefits to our health. Uh, growing chickpeas, positive impact to our environment. And again, using all parts of components of chickpea, that's amazing. That really contributes to circular economy and towards a zero-waste society. Yeah, thanks, Barbaros. And, and again, you know, big congratulations to Tally and the Innova Pro team for all the great work they're doing. And we love having you in the community. So thank you very much. And it's great to know that companies like Innova Pro are around for sure, but we definitely need to see more clean labels and sustainable solutions appearing to meet the UN Sustainable Development Goals as well. So uh, big congrats there. So it's been fascinating to hear from some more winners from the Good Food for All competition, which was held in conjunction with the UN Food Systems Summit. Please don't forget to check out part one if you haven't already. Shame on you. And we have plenty more exciting innovations to hear about. Barbaros, I have a hard and slightly unfair question as always for you. If you had to pick one of the innovations that we have heard from that you'd like to follow even closer, which one would you pick? I would say Innova Pro, but it will not be fair because they are part of our EIT Food Rising Food Stars community. So I would like to go for Red Sea Farms. Absolutely game changing, super relevant, and definitely a breakthrough solution to transform and make our food system more resilient to climate change. Thanks, Barbara. I mean, again, big congrats to everybody there. It's not like we're having favorites, really. Barbara, how connected are these SME competition winners? Actually, this was something I wanted to ask last time as well. So how does it work with the competition? Do all of these startups now kind of come together all the time? Are they following each other? Are they working together? Are they supporting each other? You know, how does the competition sort of support them along together? Well, unfortunately, of course, SMEs do not have the internal resources to be connected to the system all the time. I mean, we know that they are understaffed. They indeed deal with day-to-day -day business. But what we did is quite interesting, and I'd like to share with you and everyone listening to this podcast. Last month, we have launched the Good Food SME Hub together with the United Nations and the stakeholders that are working in the space. And we want this Good Food SME Hub to be the platform that connects all the SMEs across the world, share the good lessons, share best practices, and really interact with each other so that they can grow their businesses learning from each other or collaborating with each other. This hub will also work with the different coalitions of action emerging from the United Nations Food Systems Summit, and uh, we're really looking at identifying and matchmaking SMEs with the solution needs, with challenge owners, and really help further SMEs grow their business and transform the food system, all of us together. That's great. So does that mean that these first 50 who won this competition, are they like a first cohort or is it these, is it this 50 plus all sorts of other SMEs connecting together? It is even better than that. So all 2000 and more SMEs can now be connected to the SME hub that EIT Food helped co-found. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, in which case, I'm really looking forward to sort of seeing more innovations that come off the back of this because as we know you put great people together that's where the magic happens so uh, yeah be interesting to see what comes out of the hub again i just wanted to say a huge congratulations to all of the winners unfortunately we didn't get a chance to speak to all of them so make sure you head over to the united nations website at un.org to read more about the competition and the winners there and please also check out the EIT Food website to learn more about all the startups and about our involvement in the UN Food System Summit. That just leaves me to say thank you very much, Barbaros, for joining me once again on the show. Thanks, Matt. I could get used to this. Well, you see, your two in could be a regular feature, the Barbaros slot. I love it. 
And also thank you everybody listening to the show out there as well. This has been the Food Fight podcast from EIT Food. As ever, if you'd like to find out more, head over to the EIT Food website at www.eitfood.eu. And please also join the conversation via the hashtag EIT Food Fight on our Twitter channel at EIT Food. And if you haven't already, please everybody hit the follow button so you never miss an episode. That's it for now. See you all next time. Bye everyone. Mm-hmm.